Okay, foundations for nomenclature. This video contains some important tips and basic knowledge that will be helpful for you to know um, before you review writing names and formulas of compounds. This handout is available on OneNote in, on our online notebook, so I suggest you print it out and keep it as a reference sheet for yourself during the course. Okay, so you'll recall in grade nine needing to know the first uh, 20 elements correct spelling of the element names and symbols well you'll need to add on to that the elements uh, the metals at the bottoms of group one and two uh, you already know some of the group one and two metals but learn the names and symbols of all of group one and two as well as the halogens and then there is a selected group of metals or selection of metals here iron cobalt nickel copper zinc silver gold and mercury are all transition metals tin and lead are found at the bottom of group 14. And so you can expect metals from these groups and this list of metals here on t quizzes and tests. Okay, in number two here, I have a large table. These, this is the polyatomic ion list. Nick the Camel had a clam for supper in Phoenix is a little uh, memorization trick that we have to learn a bunch of these names and formulas. I'll I'll teach Nick the Camel in a separate video. So for now, keep this table uh, for reference, as I said in your notebook. At the bottom of that table, you'll see number three in that handout, I have classical names of multivalent metal ions. So some metals can have <clears throat> more than one possible charge, and we need to be specific about which metal ion is in a particular compound. It might be the copper one ion or the copper two ion. For example, you may have copper one chloride um, and in a different compound, copper two chloride. And so these classical names are ways of representing the metal name with the Roman numeral. And so copper one chloride, this piece here, could be replaced with cuprous. And so cuprous chloride is a classical way of naming copper one chloride. Copper two chloride, you'll see, is the cupric ion. And so this could be labeled cupric chloride. Now, the one that I'm putting a star beside here, that's your uh, proper way of naming these compounds. But you will see the classical naming system used. For example, um, if you needed an iron supplement from the drugstore, you might see ferrous gluconate. And so they'd be using the name here as opposed to iron two gluconate. And so we're asking you to learn just four of the metal ions in their classical names. So for copper, iron, tin, and lead. Now you'll notice that both tin and lead have positive two or two positive and four positive charges. And so you do have to remember which charge goes with which name. You'll notice that in each case, the two positive charges, the OUS, and the four positive charge is the ick. And what's common about that is that the lower charge, right, positive two is lower than positive four, the lower charge is the us ion, whereas the higher charge is the ick ion. And so over here for the case of copper, copper one and copper two. Copper one is lower, one is lower than two, and you'll see it's the OUS ending, cuprous. Two, being the higher of the two charges, is cupric. Iron has possibilities of two positive or three positive for its charges. And so we have the ferrous or the ferric ion. Again, the ferric ion is the three positive charge because that's the higher charge out of the possibilities for iron. So you do have to memorize these four metals with their possible ionic charges and then follow this pattern for the names that go with it. So copper's one, two, iron, two, three, tin and lead are both two and four. When we get to molecular compounds, I'll, met, I'll review this, but there's some common molecular compounds that you should know the name of. And uh, so they're listed here for your review. And so those are some very helpful pieces to know before you begin the nomenclature. Last thing we should do is just look at the periodic table, bit of a refresher here, 
Remember that we have the staircase, here it is over here, separating the metals from the nonmetals. And metalloids are found, you can see them darkly shaded, boron, silicon, right here, boron, silicon, germanium, and so on. These are the metalloids, me elements with properties of both metals and nonmetals. Notice aluminum is on the staircase, and yet it is not a metalloid. So we, aluminum is a metal. It really has the properties of a metal. So something to be aware of then on your periodic table is that the metals are on the left side and the nonmetals are on the right side. Now, a quick atomic structure review. Perhaps we'll focus in here on magnesium. Magnesium is showing here with atomic number 12, and so that tells us there are 12 protons in the nucleus, and we'll need 12 electrons spread out 2, 8, 2. Now that atom is neutral, the same number of positive and negative particles, but it's not stable. And so in order to become stable, magnesium will lose these two electrons, and in doing so forms a positive 2 charge. And you might think if it lost, why isn't it a negative charge? Well, it lost electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. Think about if you lose stress, you feel better. You feel more positive. So that can be a simple analogy that will help. Also, really what it comes down to is a comparison of the number of protons to the number of electrons. And if you count, you'll see 12 protons compared to now only 10 electrons. We actually have two more protons than we do electrons. And that's where that positive two charge comes from. Okay, and similarly, we can go across the top of the groups of the periodic table. Groups 1 form positive 1 charges, group 2, positive 2. <clears throat> Aluminum and the metals below it form positive 3 charges. We'll skip group 14 for now. Carbon and silicon tend to share electrons, and it's really tin and lead at the bottom here. And we've already seen tin and lead show up in our multivalent metals. So we're remembering that those are positive 2 or positive 4, positive 2 or positive 4. And then we're into the group 15. Now with 5 valence electrons, nitrogen will become stable by gaining 3 electrons, oxygen by gaining 2 electrons, the halogens by gaining 1, and these noble gases will not be involved in bonding <clears throat> because they have their full stable outer shell. Okay, you'll notice that I didn't put any charges above the transition metal section, and that's because we uh, have multivalent metals showing here, and until we study the quantum theory of the atom in grade 12, there really isn't a way to predict the charges of those metal ions. Okay, and so really important from the periodic table is that you are aware of where the metals and nonmetals are found, that you know the charges of the groups as I've indicated, and secondly, that you can recognize when a metal is a multivalent metal, so when it has more than one ionic charge. So we've already indicated that tin and lead can be positive 2 or positive 4. And what I'm going to suggest to you, I think sufficient for our studies, is that the transition metal section, you can essentially assume that any metal showing up in the transition metal section here needs a Roman numeral, so is a multivalent metal, except for, except for zinc, which forms two positive charge, and silver, which forms a positive one charge. And you may have noticed that up earlier in the table. I had listed those on their own in the table above. So anything that's found in a yellow box when it's part of an ionic compound, will need a Roman numeral in the name. Except for zinc and silver. So you are going to need to memorize that zinc forms positive 2 ions and silver positive 1. And that's all they form for in terms of ions, and so that's why they don't get a Roman numeral. But tin, lead, vanadium, chromium, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, all of the rest, gold, all of the rest that you see showing up in the yellow box, those all will need a Roman numeral. Which reminds me, we need to review the Roman numerals. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. That's probably as far as you need to go. If you want to track the 
um, generation, different generations of iPhones, you'll find they skipped 9 and jumped up to 10. So you might research the Roman numeral for 10 and notice how the name of that latest iPhone or uh, how they named it. Okay, so that's it for the prerequisite knowledge. We're going to be drawing on this um, information when we look at naming and writing formulas of ionic compounds. So I suggest you have these um, the test reference sheet and the nomenclature reference sheet printed out, marked up with all these little tips on it, and keep them handy as we as you move forward in the nomenclature lessons.